Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And folks, we've got a great show lined up for you today. My name's Seth Crossman and I'm joined here once again with Benjamin Brayshaw. How are you, Ben? Good, Seth. How are you doing? I'm good. I liked your good. That was a good way to just start it off. Get good. Get yeah. that in there. I want to make it firm and real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More exciting than you and me, or you and I, is Dan. Say hi, Dan. Glad to be here. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> good. Dan is uh, also a partner with Brayshaw Financial Group uh, at Brayshaw Financial. We are planners. Well, if you tuned in last week, you heard us just go on and on and on about this wonderful studio that has been built in uh, at, at the main office in Bedford. And so we all get to stand here together around this table and have fun. We're excited. This is going to make, this is going to make our technology stuff so much simpler, yeah. which I'm very excited about. That's, it only uh, took like four years. Four plus years. <laughs> yes, it did. Well, look, well, there was like the seven-year search for the new office and then... Well, it was, it, was a gr- it was great when we were doing it live on the radio. I mean, I love that. That was yeah. easy. We walked in, somebody took care of all the audio, everything was fantastic. You had to speak. There was... The dead air could not happen. <laughs> the laughter had to be at a minimum. Uh, and we made good friends, too. That was yeah. a really good, no, good was, experience. It was a good time. Good time. Hey, we're going to have a show for you. We, I promised it was going to be a good one. I have to remember what it is first and foremost because I, I want to talk about last week. But I think what we're going to talk about this week is we're going to talk about how do you how do you invest through inflationary periods? If we're taking a look at that and we're taking a look at this this possibility that we're in a in a, a soon to be or a new to, a, a, a period of inflation here, uh, maybe something that you've never experienced in your investing, you've never thought of uh, what that could look like and how that could affect your investments. Okay, we had plenty of uh, banter around what is the what is inflation and what are the things that cause and is it real and how real is it and what levels last week that was last week's show but but we want to be prepared and that's part of what looking at the big picture three dimensional investing uh, accomplishes if you have a planner and you're working with somebody in your finances this should be top of mind for them right now in how to adjust you and your personal finances to be successful through a period of inflation. So that's what the backbone of this show is going to get to today. And uh, and it is fun. Believe me, it is a great topic. And thanks for all the likes and the listens, by the way. We do appreciate that. We do. We do. Well, without further ado, we have money in the news. U.S. home prices rise at the fastest pace in 15 years. S&P CoreLogic Case Schiller Index increased 11.2% in the year ended in January, and that is the highest since February 2006. And if that means nothing to you, just try to say that phrase, S&P CoreLogic Case Schiller Index increased 11.2%, five times fast. It's a good party gig. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, Seth, I mean, with all the different things that have been happening in the uh, in the real estate world, it's kind of been that perfect storm. Rates have dropped, the interest in trying to get out of the cities, the millennials are you know, of ripe age to matriculate into their own home. And, and there's been that argument that they have never really been interested in buying real estate or, or homes and so forth. And uh, now with COVID, it, it really has pushed people to kind of reconsider that. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously with the mortgage rates hitting as low as 3% in July, it was a great incentive for anybody to even been considering it. And with the mass exodus out of cities and apartments and that kind of high-rise style of living, you know, the real estate market's been booming. Yeah, uh, like there's places in the continent that we've never seen have this kind of boom. Uh, Boise is one of them that's near us, Montana. Arizona. Didn't we do a show? Didn't we do have a money in the news thing about the different cities? I think it was like the top fastest growing places. They were paying people to come. Oh, that one. Yes, we did. We did do that. Yeah, it was like these different cities were literally offering major incentives for people to to move there. Yeah, and now we've got 
you know, at least three people that are moving to Nashville or Tennessee. I know. We know a ton of people that are moving. Yeah. I've been there and they're, I love it. I wouldn't moving mind. away from us, Seth. Uh, Dan, are you moving? Not yet, but I'm considering it now. <laughs> <laughs> Did we, t- we talked you into it. <laughs> Rates are low. <laughs> they still are. And that's an incredible part of what's fueled so much of this uh, boom in the real estate. And like you said, Dan, the the, uh, the move, the, the exodus from the city because people, I guess, realize that being outside and being able to go places was a part of the life that they enjoyed in the city and that being stripped out, wanting a yard, wanting to play, wanted to do more normal things. I talked to several real estate friends and constantly the conversation revolves around this lack of inventory. Like they just can't get a house on the market. And once it's on, it's gone. Like multiple offers again. You can't even look at houses in some areas. No, sight unseen. You better make sure that you're you know, throwing a bunch of cash at this thing and um, certainly some challenge there for the people, regardless of uh, the uh, the rates being low. I mean, first time home buyers are having real struggles to get into a market even. But yeah, the supply and demand, and that's what we were talking about last week is the money supply. Um, if we have a, a glut of money in the system, what happens with these consumer prices? Well, this is one of those areas that that in real estate that we have seen rise faster than what that 1.4, 1.6% CPI has been rising at. And it is a asset too. Real estate is an asset. And we're going to talk about that coming up uh, and can't wait. But before we do, um, Dan has been someplace that I have dreamt of. Uh, why don't you tell us, Dan, a little bit about where you've been in this in this world and what happens when you walk into places that you that you weren't quite dressed correctly? Yeah, I was lucky enough to get to take a, uh, a week-long trip to Monaco. And I was also lucky enough to experience getting tossed out of probably the finest establishment of my life. <laughs> the, uh, the Grand Casino there is a, is a heck of a take. I'd recommend it to anyone, but yeah. be sure you black tie. Oh, okay. Uh, so it wasn't your accent? No, no. no. <laughs> that, they let me in with that. I don't think I'd spoken a word yet. That, that might have helped after I tried to argue my way to stay. But, um, yeah, my finest suit was not enough. Uh, Got maybe two rooms in, and they escorted me, you know, quite quickly out the door. Just because you weren't wearing a black a tux, had to have a tuxedo, just yeah. to step in there really? and gamble, just to walk around and look. Had to be. It in a just, tux. I mean, because the, I mean, it's just been, it's been beautiful. The building must have been gorgeous. Oh, absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you see the the craps table from the James Bond movies. I mean, yeah. it, it really does look exactly like that. And uh, well, What's on the, the way out, I got pay, to. They, they got always to, play in James Bond. I can't remember. It's a baccarat. 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 Yeah. Yeah, on the way out, I took a picture against uh, the finest car I never owned, this beautiful oh. Ferrari right out front. I mm-hmm. needed to have a, a memento since I didn't really get to take it all in from the inside. I figured I'd get a quick shot on the outside. Right after they tossed oh. you, you were taking a picture. That's right. <laughs> I was hoping it was like a convertible and you like hopped over and slid in the seat and then There was a little bit of white you, snake going on, you. a little bit of that white snake video, you know, a little crawling around on the hood. But uh, You weren't wearing the black tie. They thought you were the valet. Well, you know, they already kicked me out once. I figured what's the worst they can do from here, so... They probably could tell you that before the, you, you needed to experience it. <laughs> you might want to ask next time. <laughs> so Monaco is in the news. And, um, and Monaco is one of those places we don't talk about a whole lot just because, you know, well, we don't. Well, Ben, you own a couple places there, don't you? But Well, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's why we, you know, we don't want to talk about it a whole lot. But uh, Monaco reigns now as the world's priciest area to buy a home again. Um, so, I'm, I mean, if you thought that home prices here, which... They're reasonable, in, I would say, in comparison, maybe not in comparison to the rest of the U.S., but in comparison to Monaco, uh, holy cow, uh, this country held on to the title despite a 39% drop in sales of properties. Uh, what is that, a 10 million euros or more in 2020? This is, this is just insane reading this. I mean, the average price per square meter... The per square meter price is fifty five thousand eight hundred U.S. dollars. I mean, I'm going to have to sell one of my two places. I mean, this is this is great price. <laughs> good, good time. Well, I'll keep the yachts though. Say that. Say those numbers again because they didn't. They didn't 55, really. Fifty five thousand dollars per square meter. I mean, okay. So put that in perspective to me. You're, you know, you're. I don't know. You build a house in, a, in the U.S. up here for two hundred fifty bucks a square foot. I mean, that's fifty five thousand. Fifty five thousand. I would say this is probably out of most people's budget, but that is some interesting news. <laughs> To own a place in Monaco at that price. It's the most expensive place to buy a home in the world. And I wonder why it dropped so much, like 39%, uh, as far as the activity level, 39% 
drop of purchasing in a pandemic. Are you trying to allude to the fact that this might be a bargain time to buy? Buy the dip, Seth. Buy, buy the, the dip. dip. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, when pandemics come around, and you know, we're just frankly, folks, I've never experienced one, but I'm gonna I'm gonna speak from a place that I might have. Uh, I think there's a lot of places besides Portland, Oregon, that I would prefer to live from this point. Um, and I, I do like Boise, Idaho. I like the Montana, uh, a lot, you know, mountains are beautiful, but I, I go sunny and warm. I think that's that Barbados, you know, uh, Virgin Island thing that I might, I might try to tap to. Not a bad idea. Not yeah. a bad idea. Or Monica. I, I think the thing is, is with, with all these real estate articles, I think the real point is, is that there's a change going on in society. I mean, you know, cause there's a lot you're not going to undo from this. People have made life decisions to move and to work remotely or, you know, just to change an entire lifestyle. And, and there's probably a ton of people listening that are, are living that story right now. And I mean, that's not going to change. So your negotiation, you know, as people kind of go back to the work, you know, the, the, the office, cause people are, I mean, I mean, my, our nephew, uh, my nephew visited us last week just to get out of the city and just have a place to go. Cause he was tired of working, sleeping in his apartment, doing his work in his apartment. Okay. It was, back and forth and it just wanted a break from that. He's like, I can't wait to go back to the office. I mean, and there's hundreds of millions of people that feel that way. I know that. I think a lot of those people that bought in the, in the burbs over the last year, uh, as the cities reopen are going to start to realize, Hey, now that I can go down the block and go to my favorite place or, or, you know, do the things that I used to do, maybe they will move back and be curious to see what happens in that real estate. I mean, that's, that's to me more of an opportunity right now. If you were to try to take a look at what you, where you might buy. Well, I mean, you look at, you hear, you know, Fauci talking and all these people are like, they're talking about the next pandemic. I mean, that's their conversation. You hear Bill well, Gates laughing about the good for his income. Pandemic. Yeah, it's just, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> so I don't think people are just going to go run out and sell their, you know, their. He needs to write another book. He needs somewhere else to show up and say something. So, and get well, paid more for TV it. time. Yeah. More TV time is good for him. Oh, God. I got your pandemic right here, Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, but people are not going to just give up that they bought that as an as the ability to exit. It's a, it's an exit story. It's an investment in the exit. It's it's an investment in freedom, right? I mean, that's what people are saying. They're like, I don't want to be locked down in my apartment in the city again. I don't ever want to have someone tell me to do that. Yeah. And if they drop the hint of another pandemic, I'm gone. I think one of the things that you bring up is investment, and uh, we do happen to work in that area a lot in investments from time to time, but there's a pers- there's, there's different areas and different places in our lives that we invest. Um, and what we focus on a lot is the financial piece. And one of those things that becomes, um, I think a challenge for people to navigate in purchasing a home, if that's what it is for them versus say purchasing commercial real estate or investment real estate is understanding what kind of investment happens there. Um, do I have an, a problem personally with you know overpaying for my home? Let's say that's that's what what it is, or you know, I I really you know I feel really comfortable with my budget right here at this two thousand square foot home in this this area, or I could go twenty three, twenty four, twenty four, whatever that the, the, those numbers are and pay a little more. Think of it in a ten year time frame because this is what is this is where you're going to invest in your family in your life, and it's a very different kind of investment. Try to. Yes, it's good to get the buy, you know, and buy, be able to buy low, sell high. Investment one hundred and one, probably right. It, but it's just a different classification and different kind of an investment. And I think that's one of the things we're going to bump into here in a little bit too. Yeah. Next on the list here, we have uh, an article at CNBC: um, Bank stocks rise after hours as Fed sets date to lift buyback dividend restrictions. This is by Jesse Pound. Um, now, this is very interesting. This is the kind of news we've all been waiting for on our side. I mean, the, we have, we've been long financials for, what, eight, nine months, maybe longer. Um, and, uh, you know, when they, when they stopped allowing the, the dividend buybacks and, uh, um, I mean, sorry, the stock buybacks, that was a big deal. That's a big deal. That's actually what lifts a lot of stocks and and their value. And I think you know this is one of the things that we're we've been waiting for to see you know some real time horizon on on what that looks like. And they get into that. They talk about that throughout the article. Um, on the announcement of this, um, with the it, this is basically the COVID restriction they set in place. And um, you know basically the second they announced this, I mean J P Morgan rose after hours by one percent. I mean this is a 
you know, this is a significant announcement and, and long-term uh, piece to the crisis. Because, I mean, when you talk about, um, I, I mean, they note here in the article that the Spider S&P Bank ETF is up 20% year to date. I mean, that's almost a full quarter. And I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a ton of return in, in three months. Something that uh, is not to be looked on lightly, but you still look at some of these bank stocks. And I mean, I think some of them are still pretty cheap depending, but there's still a lot of concern to, to, to fish out, like what's going to happen. You know, a lot of the sales of the bank stocks were a failure to pay on mortgages or rents or, or, or any of those things. I think, you know, Dan and I, we chat about that from time to time, just kind of going through the different investments we hear on the on the TV, we, we're constantly talking about, hey, what's going to happen to this real estate program or that real estate program? And, and these are these are big, big concerns. Yeah, I think quite a few of those banks never really recovered from the whole financial crisis of 08 and have been to some degree undervalued since. So I think this added flexibility with the lifting of that regulation coupled with interest rates likely moving and, you know, moving up, um, you know, it creates a ripe environment for the financial industry, for the banking business in particular. Yeah, and I think – you know, there was some reserves that, you know, with you know, with Dodd Frank that were put on banks that they had to have extra reserves, actually had to hold on to extra funds, and they lifted some of those those restrictions that allowed banks to actually spread out some of the cash that they had taken. Banks have basically been hoarding cash for about ten years. I mean, that's that's really where it's been, and, and it's been a requirement that they hold a ton of cash because they didn't want any more bank failures. But the release of some of these restrictions has allowed banks to spread out and potentially make more money. I mean, I saw JP Morgan, uh, you know, one analyst just raised the uh, the target price to like over 180 bucks a share. I mean, I mean, people are pro on banks and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm really curious. I mean, I caution beware because I wouldn't just start shoving your money into banks because you listen to our episode. But um, there's still a lot of things to kind of iron out in the real estate world and what's going to happen because – at the same time, J.P. Morgan themselves were just announcing – I read in another article that they were going to downsize the amount of office space they have, You know, which means if less people really do want to return to the workforce, though I think they're going to have some pushback on that just from the staff. But if less people do want to return to the, to the actual workforce, there's going to be more real estate on the market. And that's, been, that's always been the assumption, which has been the decline of the banks because people felt like there was going to be default and that just has not happened. Not, not nearly at the level that they ever thought. So, Yeah. One of the articles that I took a look at was uh, March 23rd of 2020. Uh, that wasn't all that long ago, but that's where they started to um, uh, kind of cancel the buybacks for pretty much any of the companies that are out there. And I was taking a look at the chart through that time, and it was amazing to me to see the cancellation of buybacks, but then to see the run that the stock market went from that point forward this last year was incredible. In spite of that, that didn't that didn't hinder a lot of what happened in the market this last year. Um, but the but the the headline there is that canceled stock buybacks mount. Uh, they may not return for years, and here we are, not even a year later. Well, the story could be that we haven't seen anything yet. Like if you were to say, "Hey, listen, now we're going to turn on all the buybacks back on with all these companies. It's going to be permitted again." And they haven't been able to do that yet. We've rallied through something where stock buybacks are always been a big support for our market. I mean, are we at the fledgling side of a massive bull run? Could that be the case? Well, I the mean, last one was the longest that, that I've ever experienced in spite you know, living through the 90s and, um, and that bull run. But it was the shortest bear market that we've ever gone into or been through with a, just a – I want to say – can I say wicked – since I'm over here in, in New England, like you can a, try. It's not going to sound good. Man, it was a it was a wicked run. <laughs> this last year was a wicked run. It doesn't sound as good coming from me. Yeah, ah, it doesn't. It's a, a whole. It's a whole. It was for thing it's you kind of missed. Just roll. It's kind of West Coast. I can't help myself. Yeah, you know, I think I think there's some really interesting points. I really do think that there's there's um there's kind of that unknown domain on this on on the buyback issue. Like I don't think I know we know exactly what that does. I do think we're going to have this kind of cusp event. I do think we're going to hit some sort of max and a pullback. I think that's going to happen. I think we have some time to go in there. And I've, and I've basically said that. I really think this is kind of a a summer, sometime in the summer, maybe August time period that we, we're going to see something. And I, I really think that's going to happen for a couple of different reasons. But one specifically is a lot of people who kind of reallocated and repositioned, right? I mean, they were doing it in May and June. 
they were saying these things are oversold and I've lost money here. I'm going to re- reposition and they're going to want that long-term cap gains. Yeah. You know, that's going to be some intentional stock movement, I think. And we did see an interesting June and, and August last year, I think, where, you know, we had that pullback during that time and people sell in May and then they come back and they come back and they buy in September, right? That's the whole thing. And so a lot of people have followed that, that advice in their own personal investing. So you're listening to Money on Tap. You've been listening to Money in the News and we are going to be right back. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about investing through inflation. Folks, this is going to be one of the things that you want to understand more as uh, inflation works its way through uh, and, uh, in, and whether that's a true inflation or however you want to consider that. What you don't want to do is you don't want to sell in May and not come back for five years when, <laughs> when inflation's down. You want to know how to be invested, stay invested, be long-term. We're here to help you. Listen to Brayshaw Financial Group and Money on Tap. Folks, it is so much fun for us to bring you Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman, and I am one of the hosts here at Money on Tap. I'm also a financial planner. That's what we do. That's what Ben and I do. And the fun part is, is we get to have this radio show. and We talk about important things that we think you need to listen to and be aware of to help raise the bar as far as your financial literacy. It's a big part of what we're trying to do here. The other thing that we're doing here as well, as financial planners, we are welcoming you to come and call us and to join us at Brayshaw Financial Group. Experience what complete wealth management looks like. Let's take a look at all sides of the issue, get a three-dimensional perspective and put a plan around your next step. It's so critical and so many people just leave this part out and then they find out later, oh, if I only would have known. Hey, don't let that be your story. Give us a call at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. If you have $250,000 of investable assets today, our plan is free to you. We think it's important for you to know the facts and have a playbook so you can have a successful retirement. Give us a call at 855-226-8551. Thanks for listening. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Folks, this is one of those shows that um, we're going to have a lot of fun with. And we, we hope that you, if you made it through money in the news, you're here for the long run. And you're going to learn about how to invest through inflation. Okay. Now, that may not make sense at first. Uh, and what we mean is in, inf- in, in and during an inflationary period, what do you want to be doing with your investing that's different from where we've been lately? Right. So, uh, Dan, you came up with some really interesting stuff, which is from one of my favorite people uh, when it comes to investing. Yeah. So, you know, whenever you're looking to get your arms around a trend or or understand, you know, what might happen in the future based upon what's happened in the past, there's a few better sources to go to than Mr. Warren Buffett himself, who for uh, those of us who fall in the investment world is, um, you know, one of those guys up on the Mount Rushmore of investing for sure, if, if not the very top of it. Uh, he's a guy who has seen virtually all of it and found a way to make money in every step of the way. So, you know, his advice is generally sage. And um, as I said, when you're looking at any, any particular set of conditions, a good question to ask is, you know, what would Warren do right now? And uh, luckily, he's, he's well published and there's a lot of information about what he has done in the past and and where he sees all this stuff moving forward. But in particular, I found an article that had had him interviewed at a couple different points in time talking about how he'd handled the explosive inflation through the late 70s, early 80s, which, you know, I was around for, but not not old enough to remember any of it. But um, we all have heard the stories about the gas lines and and all those kind of things where, you know, the consumer index just went right through the roof. And what his advice was is really two points I I gleaned from the article, two major points. And that was to focus on companies that generate cash rather than consume it. In other words, companies that have already invested enough in their business and their products and development and that their markets were already established that they don't need to get out into the marketplace and raise cash to do those things. 
And to secondly, look for companies that can increase prices and handle the increased business without having to spend more money to, to add to that capacity. You know, if you think of things like utilities, it's a great example of that. You know, in an inflationary environment, keep in mind that they're largely funded through bond issues, which would have already been secured at a lower rate. So as interest rates are rising, they've already got the cash on hand to meet operation. And when you think about the product that they offer, you know, things like energy and water and, and whatever it may be, they're necessities. So if they need to raise prices, it is very unlikely to, inc- to impact their demand whatsoever. So utilities is a great example of that. And there's lots of other industries that we're taking a look at that – you know, have those same traits. Really, they're firmly established. Their product is developed and marketable, and they're able to raise prices without having to have a negative impact on their demand. And there's, a, you know, as I said, a couple of different industries that we've taken a look at, and a couple of investment opportunities that I know Ben's got a, a list queued up here that we can take a look at. But those are really the things that you want to look for when you're trying to identify an opportunity in a rising in a rising interest rate environment. You know, I, I think about I think about those statements and there's some real i mean just pulling out those pieces i think what dan found here is fantastic and appreciate warren buffett for sharing that because i think there's a lot of wisdom in that i mean just understanding that in in an inflating environment if, if a company already has a a business model essentially that is working running they're producing the information i mean the what the the product and you can buy it and you still need it no matter what the scenario is it's not like you have to innovate to get to it, right? And, and if you have to innovate to get to something, those rising rates are going to cost that company more and more money to get there, and it may stop them from getting there. I mean, that's really the point I think he's making is that, hey, listen, you know, we may get to the – you know, we're already at the end of the road. We're already producing the television. We're already producing the, the, the raw energy you're consuming at your house or the food or, you know, like we've already got the farm. You know, those, those conversations, they, they're, they're already shipping it to you. You know, so combating that issue is 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 a great it's a, it's a it's a great piece of understanding for investing, especially if you're new to investing and you're just trying to get into this. You say, listen, I I think the market's at a real all time high. Maybe something's going to happen. I mean, we hear that conversation conversation constantly. I don't know that we're quite there yet. I think we have a good ways to run before we see a pullback. But um, and with you know some of the dividend release we just talked about a, a few minutes ago, I mean, there's some real there's some real upside possibilities that could happen. But if you want to run to something early, that's okay too. You know, I mean, you can run to value. We're seeing people run to value constantly right now, and people are looking for yield. That's that's a big conversation in the in the story. Yeah, I think as as Dan, you were kind of opening up the conversation around um, what did Warren Buffett do, and what would he do again? And I think we've we've leaned on a lot of that wisdom and, and his experience through different uh, kind of corridors of, of, of investing. One of the things that struck me this last year is Warren Buffett doing some things that he said he would never do. And, you know, what did he do? He bought technology. Yeah. Never. Be, and he said he would never do that because he didn't understand it. I, that was a, that was 10 years ago. Maybe it's a time and place where he's like, oh, I get it now. And now he's doing it. We did a whole show on that. We talked yeah. about all the things that Warren Buffett's all all the rules he broke. Bro, yeah, breaking rule after rule. These these were hard and fasts for him. And I'm and I'm just curious enough, I guess, uh, in in the discussion to say, what are some of the new norms that we're going to see coming through an inflationary period? What we saw this last pullback, uh, February and March, which was a bear market. Some of the traditional trades that we would that we would make that we, that have worked historically, which would be some of those uh, utilities, for instance, right? They were no longer the rules to the investment world. We saw a Zoom takeoff. We saw Amazon. We just saw different places that were now the recessionary trade of today. And I do wonder, as we have this conversation, keep in mind that these are these are things we want to talk about. We want to think of because there well, is going to be some new places for us to go and consider in, in, in this inflationary period. I, th- I think we need to jump in here though and define – You know, I, always, I was always taught that how you language something is really important. And I, I, think, I think we need to language the fact that there's kind of like there's the inflationary trade. There's the recessionary trade. And now I think we have the pandemic trade. OK. You know what I mean? Like I, I honestly think like, we, like breaking out the, the three items because you're right. I mean 
who knew that Zoom was going to skyrocket and then they're down like 30 or 40 percent year to date? I mean, it, they're taking a huge hit. Does that mean that Zoom's a buy? I'm not sure it is. But is it here to stay? Yeah, it's here to stay. So, you know, like that's a great pandemic trade. I don't know that it's a recessionary trade. It, very, very true. You but, know what I mean? But, but, it, but we were – in a recession, and it's and it's, and it was right. it was it was like there's this recession, but it wasn't a recession that was brought through um, the economy. Yeah, it was it was outside of that affected the 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 economy the way it did. So it's a very different place that we've gone through, and um, and inflation is a place that we haven't experienced since what the the eighties, and maybe we just haven't experienced that. When you have a twenty percent pullback. You know, that's when you're going into a bear market, right? And so we had that event. We had a forced recession, which was really a pandemic. So I wouldn't, I would exogenic probably. Exogenic was the word I was looking for. Exogenic from outside. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great word for it. I think as we break through defining those pieces, it's really important, I think, for people as we walk into investing because we do it automatically. Like we, we look at, we look at the events, we look at the circumstances, we look at the impact and, and we, we forecast, we foreshadow, we we try to figure out exactly where people are going to move to to meet their needs and then say, that need's going to have a higher demand. We want to own those companies. We want to own that sector. We want to own that industry. And you do it. And, and I, I would say this too. We do it in a way. And I'm going to bring in Tom Brady. Is he coming Brady. in here today? I'm going to bring him in right now. He's going to come and talk to us about picking your spot, making the throw, and how do you do it so successfully? And he just – it's a second nature. He knows how to do it. He's done it so many times in the past. It's, he can do it blindfolded. And he's just the best at what he does, right? So it's that, it's that muscle memory. It's the re- rinse, repeat. And you, when you're doing this all day long and throughout the week over years and years and years, the conversation we have comes to a decision much more quickly and an understanding at least much more quickly where we're setting ourselves up in, in what we're looking for in the next week, two, three, to a month getting ready to pull triggers yeah. that might very well take you the next six months to a year to just even get to. I mean, our whole investment committee, we sat down, we talked about if this happens or that happens, this is where we see value coming into play. I mean, that's we talked about that. We had this conversation literally two days ago. Yeah. You know, I, I think about you know going through those pieces and saying to myself, you know, in an inflationary environment, if that's really where we're heading and you're, you're convinced as a listener that's where you're heading, and we've got some ideas for you. I think some people are doing it intrinsically. I look at some of the things that we've come up with, and I think it's happening naturally for people, you know, in, inside all of that. Though I think this pandemic event, a forced recessionary event, you know, has driven some of these actions, but I think they're the natural cause and effect scenario that's playing into that, which is interesting. So I'm going to break out with number one here. Real estate. Real estate is probably the top number item of almost any recessionary play. I mean, it can come in a lot of forms. I think that's what we we detail as we were kind of breaking this out, right? We, we, we came up with a number of different pieces. But when it comes to real estate, like, well, what are you talking about real estate? We, maybe you're buying rental property. What happens with real estate? You know, you get that fixed mortgage, which puts you in one component that, that stabilizes the inflationary piece there. And then you have a rental income that usually moves with an inflationary event that continues to rise. Yeah. So as inflation happens, so does the like the cost of goods and services and rent being one of them that we talked about on last episode is, right. is, is one of those indicators of inflation. So as that's going up and the inflation's going up and your rate has stayed the same, as long as your cash flow is increasing while your hard costs have stayed static. Yeah, no, totally. What's great about that is that your, your income is moving perfectly in the corridor of inflation usually. I mean, you might be a little step behind if you got a rent cap out there. you got a rent cap. Yeah, yeah, I'm, thinking, going on. I'm, thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about all of these things. We're that you're assuming people are paying their yeah, rent. Right. We're, assuming, yeah, we're taking a couple of big ifs here, okay, yeah. right? So uh, yeah, that, that's definitely one of them. Um, but let's say you're not the buyer of rental property. You don't want to be the landlord. You don't want the phone call for the for the hot water tank or the, there's a hole in the wall or you know whatever the story is. Maybe real estate, real estate investment trusts, uh, REITs. You know, the traded REIT space is very interesting. It's It's high yield. But then again, there's all this speculation about who's going to who's going to rock out and, and win in this area, and who's the most vulnerable. Because when you start getting into, you know, equities that you know trade in, inside this real estate space, it could be multifamily, it could be 
hospitality. It could be you know uh, grocery stores. It could it could it be could be malls. It could be well or mismanaged. Exactly. Yeah. So you you have that factor even in a good sector you might get burned on. I mean infrastructure real estate has been an interesting component I think for years. I mean there's there's a lot of real estate in that area. Yeah, I don't want to talk about this next one, but I'm just going to mention it. Short-term loans secured by real estate. The, the idea <laughs> of, of leveraging yeah, your real estate right, to get right. some money out totally. and to invest. Yeah. I, I mean, I've done that. Yeah. I mean, I've looked at it th- I've looked at the market and I've said, "Hey, at different times I said, "Hey, the market looks low. I don't feel like I'm getting the yield out of the bank. I'm going to take the money out." I mean, yeah. rates have dropped for not something I would recommend. It's straight up is a very high risk area. From a compliance standpoint, we're not even allowed to take money from those types of assets and reinvest. I mean, that's Absolutely not. because they want to discourage that. But that is an area that's a place that people play in. I, I would not encourage that by any means, but that's definitely on our list. And then fourthly, buy a home, which has been happening. And that's, that's kind of where I think that intrinsic events are just happening. Yeah, well, mortgage rates being where they're at. I mean, especially if you were able to strike over the summer and uh, you know, even as inflation potentially sets in here, mortgage rates compared historically remain very low. If you find that opportunity, mm-hmm. it's a great investment. I love how that one happens without people even having to think about it. So, you know, if you've done that recently, pat yourself on the back. You did a good thing uh, for you and your family. And it's an, and again, that's one of those investments that, that pays dividends in, in so many other ways other than the price of that home going up and becoming a different kind of an asset for you. Segment two here that we're going to uh, step into a little bit is commodities. Commodities. And this is an area I like that- how Dan was knocking on this door. I want Dan. I, Dan, you want this Dan is a to big, take it? Yeah, this is a big Dan area. This is all right, Dan. This is a big Dan area. <laughs> yeah, I'm the raw material guy for sure. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, commodities are things, you know, kind of leading back into uh, Warren Buffett's point. They're essentials in a lot of ways. Um, you know, food, health care. Shelter, technology, which we can't live without at this point, you know, those are the types of things that in this world that we're in, we just need to have. And as those prices increase, it's not going to impact necessarily how much of any given one of those that we buy. I mean, for for one thing, we've been looking at some home improvement projects and the price of a two by four. I mean, it's seven dollars around here. I mean, that's inflation for you right there. Um, So when you see that those types of price increases are, are making their way through these types of investments, you know, maybe it's the time to be in on it. Yeah, I, I think the building materials thing is is hit everyone because I, I think that's something that everyone can relate with because we've all been kind of at home saying, All right, honey, we'll get that project done now <laughs> you know? And what happens? You look at the price, you're like, Well, you know we were gonna do that bathroom for I don't know, five grand, twenty grand, whatever the thing. I was talking to somebody out in California and they told me it was gonna be forty thousand dollars to redo two bathrooms. That's crazy. But when you look at that, he's like the building materials, they're literally charging us flat rate for the people saying this is whatever the materials cost. We're doing that at a standard markup because they're moving so fast. We could give you a price and we could put 20% or whatever they put on top of it. And then next thing you know, they're losing money. In the hole that quickly. Folks, you're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at your money on tap.com. We are talking about how you can invest through an inflationary period. I think we're going to jump back into some commodities. And when we do come back, I got some questions here for Dan, the commodities guy. And <laughs> you can, you can reach us at 855-226-8551. We'll be right back. Call us today at 855-226-8551. And get your free consultation with Ben Brayshaw or Seth Crossman or any one of our partners and find out what's going on in your plan, your estate plan, your financial plan, or what you're planning at all, if nothing. Get it fixed, get it right, get it done today. Give us a call at 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. I want to take a second here to thank the podcast listeners and radio listeners as well. There's so many people out there that you could be spending your time with. The fact that you're here with us today, we value that and we want to make it worth your time, worth your while to stay here and to come back again and get this information, take it into how you eat, sleep, 
breathe your personal finances, okay? That's what we're all about here at Money on Tap. We're going to give you some great stuff. Again, we're in a segment here that we're talking about investing through inflation or inflationary periods, something that hasn't really been a part of the conversation. Uh, it, you could go back to that 08 influx of, uh, of capital and as the Fed came out and started buying Right, these buying buying bonds, and how did they do that to create a bunch of liquidity in the market? And that was one of the that was one of the last. It feels like that was one of the last conversations we had before we started having these trillion dollar buyouts that that have been coming through the market. And how does that affect us as far as inflation? Because you have a bunch of money out there that's been printed. That's going to affect the overall outcome of what the value of that money is in relationship to the goods and the services that we buy. So how do we start to think about? What we're doing today in our in our investments to kind of counteract that. Talked about real estate. Uh, if that's one of the things that you're interested in or that you're wanting to walk through, we do this a lot with our clients. It's one of those places where we just love being a part of uh, them being active or passive investors in this area. And commodities. This is one that doesn't come up, up so much, but Dan... Uh, Michelon here is is taking it on the head and he's going to go ahead and grab more of this. And the question I have for you, Dan, is this. You talked about food, healthcare, energy, building materials. And building materials is one of those – raw materials is one of those places that just that's – what, that's what commodities is. But you didn't talk about pork bellies. And I was wondering when <laughs> were you going to bring in the darn pork bellies for us to get that in? Because how is that a commodity uh, today? Uh, and then would you please talk about technology? Tech is not something that people relate to a, a commodity, is it? Well, I don't think previously, but um, before we get there, I do have a, a special affinity for bacon, so I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> I've uh, yet to purchase the pig farm, but that's, that's high on the list. Uh, but technology, I think it is something new to think of as a commodity simply because we've just become so dependent on it. And I think the pandemic kind of forced our hand with that. And uh, for anybody who's doing the, the homeschooling routine or the work from home, I mean, uh, your internet connection, whether it's 5G or whatever the next thing might be, um, it's just a, it's a critical aspect of living life these days. So uh, I think everything that, that goes into that, the ability to stay connected, you know, is essentially a commodity now. Yeah, um, I would totally agree with that. I mean, just looking at the concept of not having internet. I mean, in today's world, the way things have functioned, we've become so dependent on it. How is not having a cable connection an option? I got a 15-year-old who was down a cell phone for about 12 hours, and uh, that was a crisis. That was a (laughs) full-blown pandemic-level crisis. (laughs) I'll show him a crisis. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when's the last time you you walked off and left your cell phone someplace and you had to deal with without it? A few minutes of panic and the the sweats (sighs) kick in and, uh, you know, who, who can find my phone fast enough? Right? It's uh, scary moments. <laughs> My 10-year-old daughter, Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to like one of the original conversations that I do want to have is kind of accepting the new normal. Uh, and I think technology being a part of the commodities conversation is, is a new normal. We wouldn't – I mean you would take a look at 2000 where um, you know, the tech bubble happened. It, it was – it's just the market just was wiped out. And that was very, that was a recession that we went through in that period, and that was a bubble through the markets, very different than what we've experienced this last year. Um, but is technology still in the same place it was in 2020? And we we do take a look at things in the market that might cue us up to say, well, we're getting darn close because you know the earnings uh, uh, forward earnings uh, on the market right now. It's, it's getting pretty darn close to those 2020 levels, and that's one of the conversations. If people are having those out there like, oh, this is the next bubble. We're here. Uh, and fear the market because it's going to collapse. Those are, the, those are some of those things that, are, that people are looking at and, and making those, those statements based off of. But I think it is a very interesting place to consider. Well, I think uh, one of the things that's different now versus then is that you know, uh, back in the early 2000s, everything technology was growth. Right, you know, those that was that style of investing. That was that style of stock. You know, since technology has become so ingrained in all that we do and how business works, you know, there are technology companies that are value companies these days, and those are probably the ones that fit into this inflation adverse or are able to to ride through this inflationary period. Is is companies that fall into that category? The technology companies that provide us the infrastructure for what we do. It isn't necessarily the software or the new gadget. It's the it's the components. 
and it's the, the things that are critical to build the technology and make sure that you know everything works between us at home and on the couch and, and getting that order into Amazon. So would Amazon be a one of those technology companies that you would say would ride through an inflationary period? Well, I, you know, it's uh, it's not a, a component builder, but it's a uh, you know, at least in my house, it's a it's a necessary evil. Yeah, I mean, people that's, have proved it. They're like, I'm not about to give that up. I mean, halfway through the pandemic, my kids started calling the Amazon guy uncle. So, I mean, uh, oh, he, was, so he was a regular. He was a regular. <laughs> that's so sweet. <laughs> Cooking him dinner, cool. sitting him down. True you, facts. Were you True one of those facts. families that were putting out the, uh, the 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 basket of snack goodies and the thank you message for the for the delivery drivers as they came by? That was like a Facebook fad I saw there for a little bit. Yeah, we weren't there. We just had the kids waving at the window. But, um, mm. you know. You probably would have had me showing up at your house. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> uh, gold and precious metals. Uh, this is one of those places that has been historic um, in terms of recession. And if you were to take a look at that 07, 08 period, that was really, I, th- I would say, the last big boom that we saw in the gold precious metals market. And that was the, the devaluation of our market, of our, our dollars. And potential inflation that was coming in through the printing of the money and the money systems. I want to call that something else, more technical, but it's money systems right now. But that's what gold just went through the roof. And this is one of those places where people I've had the conversation over and over again. My dad, one of them actually, that that brought it to my attention. This is a high risk place to be in, first and foremost. Commodities can be as well. I mean, commodities are a high risk because they are cyclical. Right. You know, so if you get in when... Hey, listen, if, you're, if we're the buried in the middle of an inflationary event and commodities have skyrocketed, you know, and you're, you're like, oh, everyone should own commodities. By the time you hear it as a listener, you're probably too late. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? By the time it gets down to the common person of, hey, this is how you should invest, you probably missed the boat, right? Where I think precious metals come into play. We talk to clients about this pretty regularly. And I mean, I always get that, hey, end of the world yeah. conversation. I tend to just tell people, listen, we're, we're not really trading the gold space, the silver space. Like, I mean, I can't, I can't remember a time that we intentionally put a gold ETF. I, I don't know of a time. I don't know of a time when we took a gold or silver or platinum position in any portfolio we manage. We've looked at it and we kind of go, meh. <laughs> We're okay without you. Right. It, does it mean that it won't exist and no. that we'll pull the trigger and no one no. will know about it until – No, but we could well hang out on this position for 10 years plus without it ever moving and doing anything for us. Right. You could just – you could sit there dormant forever. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting about gold and precious metals is I, I tell people that there, there's more of an intrinsic value to owning it. Like if you really have this kind of doomsday personality and you're saying, hey, listen, I really think there's a crisis coming. If there is a crisis coming and the whole stock market collapses and all sorts of craziness happens, you, they're not going to send you the gold. No. Okay? They're not going to send it to you. So if you really think that gold's like a, a bigger story, a bigger conversation, then I would say, listen, look for maybe a physical asset purchase. That might be something. And, and invest in a safe. That might be a direction to consider. As for whether or not we're like heading to an inflationary event and you want to buy gold, you could do that. I wouldn't personally put it in our portfolio now. We're not. I'm not looking to make that call. If you think inflation's here for a short period of time and gold's going to skyrocket and you're going to make some big money off of it, great. I know people who have made money off gold. They're usually very advanced traders. <laughs> They're playing lots of different positions in gold and, and silver. It is a inflationary investment, but you have to be really certain that that inflation's coming. Yeah. And you have to be really certain it's going to it's going to spike heavily. I feel far more confident going into like the utilities and Having more liquidity in an area like that, collecting a dividend in the process, you know, there's the Verizon. In an inflationary event, yeah, absolutely. I, you, I, you made a great point the other day, and I was thinking. I make um, them every day, all day. Yeah, well, okay. Well, yeah, this, this particular one happens to stand out to me, I guess, then. <laughs> um, no, when we were talking about the inflationary world and we were talking about what the, the government's doing and telling us it's 1.68% inflation and, and kind of going through that. And then when we made that comparison about how if you took their standards in 1980 and we took their standards in 1990 and overlaid them on today, we'd be somewhere between 5 and 9% inflation using their math, their standards that were prior to this. But that would ultimately impact every item that they – Standby, right? So, I mean, if if Social Security is going to get an increase, they're going to get an increase based on what their inflationary levels are. So, if they want to reduce their their increase in Social Security to reduce their liabilities, all they need to do is say, "Let's make inflation lower." <laughs> it's more of that new math. Yeah, new math. I know. It's like so. That's a really very interesting piece, and I think that 
you know, gold and precious metals. I mean, those are very good conversations for that. But that's a bigger gamble than I think, in your point, Seth or, or, or Dan, in, in energy or uh, even healthcare. I think with the aging demographic and you know, thirty percent plus of America is going to be over sixty-five in the next twenty years. There's going to be some huge healthcare demands, and that means big money for pharma. That's a big issue. I like number four. We've chatted a little bit about this. This is kind of funny. I mean, investment grade art. I don't even know how to get into this, right? It's investment grade art was the fourth item we came up with. And what's interesting about this is that you know not everyone can go out and buy the Mona Lisa, right? I mean, that's not that's not something you can do. But now you're looking at these NFT stocks and ETFs and everything else. I mean, it's like these non-fungible tokens and buying a piece into these rare video clips or rare tweets. I, I mean, I don't know, but they're, they're talking about these things being pieces to offset that. I mean, there's lots of kind of this, this world of new perceived money that's kind of becoming this potential inflationary conversation. I don't know how that pans out. I don't know how that works. I mean, it's hard to go out and say, I'm going to buy this piece of art and someone's going to want to buy it from me later on for more money. It's even harder to fathom wanting to buy a tweet or a highlight from a sporting event. I mean, it, it's, it's just really hard stuff to fathom. I mean, but there's a market there. Dan and I, we talk about all the time how we used to collect baseball cards, you know, and Dan worked at a baseball card shop. And I can really appreciate owning that card. And other people can own the same card, but there's a limited quantity of those cards. And there's, some, there's, there's a physical, tangible asset you have. I, I, it's hard for me to understand the tangible nature of feeling like you own something when you own a tweet. Yeah, it's just, uh, just out there on the internet for anyone to view. I mean, at, at, at some point, you have to extract value. I, mean, I just I don't know how to do that. I understand why people want the rights to our first show. I mean, we'll make that an NFT. I mean, that sa- seems like a good move, right? That's <laughs> so, for the Smithsonian, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have one more thing to say about gold. And uh, and if, if you wanted to debunk what everything. What a downer. He, said, he, did, he didn't even play into it. Come on. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so back. I'm behind the times here. I'm still stuck on this gold thing. And it just was like, I got it. I got it. I get it. So if you were to take a look at the gold uh, value of gold in, in 1980, 614 an ounce. How much? Uh, 614 an ounce. Uh, now 1,775 is approximately what that is today. Now, if you take a look at, if you take a look at that and, and, uh, and, and what is that, what is that return over that last 40 years? It's like, it's like a four percent, four point seven percent return. Mm. Yeah, on that, and and that right there is, I think, where you you might go into. Does this beat beat the inflation piece, right? And you, but you could also take a look at that in comparison to markets and say, yeah. hey, you would have been way better off in other places. And I think that's where people have this mis- mystique around gold that it's the safe thing, and they just need to understand. Mm, no, it's volatile. It goes yeah, up, it goes down. It's super volatile. Yeah. It's super volatile. That's good. Thanks, Seth. Um. We have a couple other things here. We're, we are uh, we are running out of time, but um, you know probably the one thing I think we could end on today, um, even though it's not our entire list. And, and if you are looking for more information, you know feel free to give us a call. We can happy to to dive in that. But um, tips tips are something that um, Treasury We're doing all the time on money on tap <laughs> all the time. So, but Treasury inflation protected securities. The tips are those are the bonds you can buy from the U.S. government that that basically they're inflation protected. So you you collect your yield. Let's say you're getting three percent, and if inflation rises three or four percent, they're gonna they're gonna mitigate that by inflating the value of your bond, which then inflates the distribution you have. It's a very common purchase item for people who are looking at it in the bond world and ultimately saying, I, I'm really concerned about an inflationary event. You know, if you do buy a bond and it's not it's not inflation protected, you know, that's a big problem. I mean if you have a, a bond paying you three percent in a yield but inflation rises four percent, you just lost a one percent return. Your va- your bond is going to be devalued because new bonds will be selling for more money. Well, uh, I would say yes, but right now, if you were to take a look at the yield on your five-year, it's a negative 1.77, all right? Uh, you're going to have to get a 30-year to get a 0.1% yield on any of those. Uh, so good luck with that one. But traditionally, yeah, that would work. <laughs> uh, and what to avoid, you know, bonds, I think, are one of those places that we want to just say, stay away. Uh, high, uh, high PE stocks are another place that would that even even now, I would say, probably – with as crazy as the market might be in that in that whole realm, just probably not the safest play to make. Yeah. Thank you. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. 
You can also find us at Facebook. We're at backslash 3D investing. We're also on Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. And as always, you can also find us at yourmoneyontap.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking our podcast. We appreciate you. And we can't wait to make it a great day and a great life with you here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit or protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551. Well, bye.